Okay, so, mm -hmm. so we are about okay, to start you... now. Yeah, yeah, we can see now your slides. Can you see the, third, uh, the third session? And uh, Martina, you can continue with the micro, cosmic microwave uh, background uh, um, issues uh, whenever you would like. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Olga. Thanks for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Uh, okay. Yes, 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 sure. Okay. Okay, yes, I will uh, take just a fraction of this last lecture to cover the um, theory of, uh, of CMB and then we will move straight to discuss the observational probes of the standard cosmological models and what constraints they can help us put on fundamental physics uh, um, and um, uh, possibly deviations to the standard cosmological model. But let's start with uh, what remains to be discussed about the CMB. So we left uh, with this picture of the evolution of the monopole term for the CMB, um, which is telling us that the evolution of the uh, monopole fluctuation is different if we are during radiation domination or matter domination, because we have a different balance between uh, the two components. Uh, at the time of uh, decoupling, um, the CMB photons decouple from uh, baryonic matter and start their journey throughout the universe. So they leave uh, the so-called last scattering surface, uh, which is defined uh, in terms of the um, number of scattering between uh, us and uh, um, and this surface uh, in terms of this uh, optical depth. Uh, basically, the time of the uh, last scattering corresponds to the time at which this quantity is equal to one, and therefore photons have just scattered once uh, uh, with uh, free electrons between the time of decoupling and the time of uh, observation today. Uh, so from the last scattering surface on, uh, photons travel almost uh, untouched throughout the uh, evolving structures, the large scale structure of the universe. And we will see in a while uh, why I say that they are almost uh, unperturbed. Uh, after decoupling, uh, since there is this uh, separation between uh, radiation and, um, uh, and matter, uh, the universe is said to be transparent. Basically, the condition is similar to uh, the condition that you can have when you observe uh, the sky through uh, some very deep clouds, uh, in a sense that when the universe was very uh, optically thick and radiation was tightly coupled to baryons, it wasn't possible to receive any information uh, from um, from that stage of, that stages of the universe because photons were continuing continuously scattered of uh, uh, free electrons and therefore they cannot leave this tightly coupled fluid. But at the time of decoupling, they can uh, they were free uh, to um, to travel throughout the universe and therefore carry all the information that they have been collecting during the early stages of the evolution of the universe and arrives to the observers, arrive uh, uh, to us, carrying this picture of the early universe. In fact, often it is said that the CMB provides us uh, with a picture of the universe at the time of decoupling, because the pattern uh, of CMB and isotropies that we observe today uh, have been, uh, has been imprinted by the um, thermodynamics and by the physics uh, that was at play uh, during the early universe up to the time of uh, recombination. On top of this, uh, there are some secondary effects that come from the interaction uh, that CMB photons have with the forming uh, structures in, um, in the universe. One of these uh, most important uh, uh, secondary effects is the so-called CMB lensing. From general relativity, we know that uh, the, uh, the path uh, of radiation is bended by the uh, gravitational potential of, uh, of massive objects. Uh, and the CMB in uh, interacting with the forming structures, matter structures in the universe uh, is not different from this picture. Uh, 
basically uh, when the CMB photons leave the last scattering surface and travel throughout the universe towards uh, the observers, uh, they um, uh, do not travel in, uh, in straight lines, of course, but they encounter the gravitational potentials of these forming giant structures of matter and the cosmic web uh, in the universe, and therefore their path is bended by this gravitational potential. This means that when we observe the CMB photon uh, at a given direction in the sky, uh, that, photons is not, uh, that photon is not really coming from that direction uh, at the last scattering surface, but from a slightly uh, bended or uh, shifted direction on the last scattering surface, where this shift uh, is due to uh, the uh, gravitational lensing of the forming structures in the universe. This gravitational lensing effect is of, or, is of the order of 2.5 uh, arc minute on average, so it's a very tiny, tiny shift, but nevertheless it leaves a very peculiar imprint, imprint on the distribution of anisotropies in the CMB. And the most important imprint is that uh, it introduces a tiny level of uh, uh, non Gaussian signatures in the distribution of CMB anisotropies, especially on small um, angular scales or um, um, very, um, very large wavelengths. Um, and by uh, observing, uh, uh, by using uh, this non Gaussian distribution at very small scales, it is possible to infer uh, this uh, distortion field, uh, which is proportional, of course, to the amount of matter that is distorting the path uh, of CMB photons. And we will see later why this is, uh, uh, this is important in terms of the observational probes uh, uh, of the universe. Um, another important effect uh, that is related to the uh, CMB field is the fact that uh, the CMB is partly uh, linearly polarized. Uh, the linear polarization arises from the uh, scattering between photons and electrons. We know that due to the scattering, the, uh, the radiation gets uh, polarized. Uh, and the important, the key point here is that uh, the polarization in the CMB field can arise only if there is a quadrupolar pattern of anisotropies in the CMB field. Um, if, if you would like to have a, uh, an interactive view of why uh, this, is, uh, this is necessary, you can click on this link uh, here and, uh, and see a very nice uh, cartoon of the generation of linear polarization in, in the CMB. But for the moment, let um, just follow me uh, for, for one second with this very qualitative argument. The idea Martina, here sorry. is that... Martina, yes. sorry, there is one question in the chat. So oh, okay. the, is, do, do we expect to stop existing at some point in the future, or do we expect CMB will keep coming from far places of the universe always? Uh, the chat. Um, and is, if we, if we, if, if the me, CMB yeah. will be always there <laughs> because it's traveling from abroad. So yeah, well, from abroad, no, from farther will... away. No, it will always. Uh, um, it will not yeah. stop. Uh, traveling throughout the universe because it is um, um, it is everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it, it is ubiquitous in the universe, so it will always be observed. What is changing is, of course, the redshift of this radiation because as the universe uh, keeps it expanding, um, the, the the temperature, the average temperature of the CMB field uh, is uh, is modified by this expansion. We have seen that. Uh, the, uh, the evolution of, uh, um, of um, the uh, decoupled species is going uh, as the inverse of the scale factor. And so the temperature will be uh, lower and lower as the universe expands. So it will reach some point at which it will be so, uh, in, so low in intensity that it will become extremely challenging to observe both uh, the, the total intensity of the field and also anisotropies on top of this uh, uh, total intensity. But of course, in order to happen, uh, we need to wait for, uh, for a long time and probably much longer than, uh, than our own lifetime and, and possibly uh, of the next generation. So it, it is a possibility that, that it will, um, 
be important for next to next uh, to next generations. But no, we don't expect it to to stop um, at any time. Thanks, Martina. Thank you. Um, Okay, so we were explaining why we need a quadrupolar uh, anisotropy pattern in order to source the polarization in the CMD field. And the reason is the following. We know that when um, radiation interacts with the scatter of, um, of an electron, uh, what is transferred is just the orthogonal uh, polarization with respect to the, to the incoming and outgoing direction. So if instead of having a quadrupolar pattern uh, incoming from Y or from X direction, we have a linear pattern, um, we can expect that if a linear polarization, suppose that only this horizontal red line uh, is propagated due to the scattering uh, of uh, a linear polarization along the Y axis uh, and then propagated along the Z axis, so if only this horizontal red line here is, um, is propagated because of, the, um, uh, of linear polarization coming along the y-axis, uh, this linear polarization here can be compensated by um, an equivalent polarization coming from uh, uh, the, um, an orthogonal polarization, sorry, coming from the x-axis and balancing uh, what is coming along the y-axis. If instead we have a quadrupolar pattern, uh, then um, what is propagating along the y-axis in addition with the, what is propagating along the x-axis, it's uh, mm, more, uh, less probably balanced by a similar pattern that is coming from the opposite directions. And so the net effect is that a quadrupolar, a quadrupolar pattern, so a um, quadruple term in the Boltzmann hierarchy for CMB photons is responsible for the generation of linear polarization in the CMB. But we have seen that uh, if we are in the tightly coupled regime, what really matters is just the monopole term and the dipole term, so the first two terms in the Boltzmann hierarchy. Therefore, as long as we are in the tightly coupled regime, we cannot source uh, any polarization pattern because we don't have uh, a large enough quadrupolar term that can be the source of CMB polarization. So CMB polarization is only sourced when we have a, um, a non-negligible quadrupolar term in the hierarchy uh, of, uh, of the Boltzmann equations, and this happens more or less at the time of recombination, when uh, the tightly coupled regime uh, is no longer uh, applied, uh, CMB photons start to uh, decouple and free stream from, uh, from matter, but still we have uh, uh, free electrons around. Of course, the other important ingredient is that we have free electrons uh, of which CMB photons can, uh, can scatter off. Um, and so these two conditions, not tightly coupled regime and free electrons around, are um, matched more or less uh, at the time of, uh, of recombination. So CMB polarization is not sourced, uh, at least the scalar polarization is not sourced um, at early times, but instead is sourced at the time of, uh, of decoupling. It is um, very common to um, describe the CMB polarization field in terms of two uh, scalar components, uh, which are the E modes or uh, uh, Carl free uh, component that has not a definite, a definite endedness, and the B mode or divergence free uh, component, which instead has a very uh, definite uh, endedness. And you can see an example of the two modes uh, here in this cartoon uh, where we have the E modes uh, on the left, and instead these very curly uh, B modes uh, on the right. This, um, this, different, this different property in terms of uh, endedness is very important because scalar perturbations do not have uh, endedness. Uh, so they can only be a source of uh, the E mode like polarization. In order to have B mode uh, polarization, we need to have a different source uh, for, um, for this kind of polarization, which is not related to the, to the scalar modes. In other words, uh, uh, we need tensor perturbation to the metric, 
to produce a B-mode pattern, a primordial B-mode pattern in the CMB field. And this is connected to uh, the question that was asked uh, uh, this morning uh, about uh, how we can measure uh, the tensor to scalar ratio um, and, uh, and have an handle on the physics of inflation. We can measure it through uh, observing this B-mode pattern in the, um, in the CMB field, because this B-mode pattern can only be sourced by tensor perturbation in the metric. There are no other uh, possibilities, at least for this peculiar pattern, to be sourced by other uh, kind of perturbations. This picture is uh, um, complicated a little bit uh, by the fact that uh, um, we have gravitational lensing. We have seen that for scalar perturb for temperature uh, perturbation, total intensity perturbations, gravitational lensing has the effect of uh, slightly bending uh, the incoming direction of CMB photons. The same kind of uh, distortion is applied to the polarization field uh, as it is summarized uh, in this cartoon picture here, where we have a, a new mode uh, pattern arising from, from the background, uh, arising from the last scattering surface then this emote pattern travels uh, through uh, these uh, purple lines here that summarize the cosmic web, uh, the uh, large scale structure of the universe. And as they travel across these forming structures, they are slightly distorted in a way that when we observe the CMB field after having traveled across this forming structure, what we observe is not uh, a completely um, E-mode uh, uh, polarization, but instead uh, we observe a kind of uh, Carly B-mode polarization that is due to the distortion of the E-mode field uh, for gravitational lensing. So there is an additional source of B-mode polarization that comes from the fact that we are distorting the E-mode polarization um, and this um, uh, induces the fact that even if uh, there were no um, tensor perturbations to the metric, so no primordial B-modes, we can still observe uh, a tiny fraction of, um, not really tiny, but a, a consistent fraction of B-modes in the CMB, which comes from a completely different origin with respect to primordial gravitational waves. And in fact, this is one of the main contaminants for the observation of the tensor to scalar ratio with the CMB. Because in order to uh, extract uh, the true uh, amplitude of the primordial gravitational waves, uh, we have to remove uh, this spurious uh, uh, B-mode signal that instead is coming from secondary effect uh, in the late time universe. At the same time, because this kind of pattern is due to uh, the interaction between CMB photons and the late time uh, uh, physics of the universe, uh, this very same signal, which acts as a contaminant for uh, searches of primordial gravitational waves, can also be thought uh, as an important source of information about uh, the uh, history of the universe at very late times. Because from this uh, um, distorted pattern, again, we can extract information about the forming structures in the universe. So it has a, a two-side um, um, two side effect. Uh, in, in one case, it is considered a bad thing since it, it covers our primordial signal. But um, at the same time, for another class of physicists and cosmologists, it is an invaluable source of information about the late time universe. Um, finally, Another uh, epoch during uh, the evolution of the universe where polarization can be sourced um, is an epoch which is more or less similar to the time of recombination, but it happens uh, uh, much later uh, in, uh, in time. So at very, very low redshift, a redshift of order a few when recombination is happening at redshift of order 1100. Uh, this epoch is the so-called reionization epoch when the first stars in the universe uh, um, ignited and the uh, radiation that they emitted was energetic enough to reionize uh, the neutral uh, intergalactic medium uh, that was around uh, at that time. So there is an, another epoch in the universe where we have a bunch of uh, free electrons going around and CMB photons can scatter off these, uh, again, these free electrons. 
Remember that at this point, CMB photons are free streaming, so we have, again, a sizable uh, quadrupolar pattern in the, in the Boltzmann hierarchy, and quadrupolar pattern plus free electrons scattering of CMB photons produces another um, uh, polarization pattern in the CMB field. Uh, this specific pattern is localized uh, at different scales, at different wave numbers, uh, with respect to the uh, recombination pattern. In particular, the reionization uh, pattern is pushed towards uh, much larger scales with respect to the polarization pattern that we observe from recombination. And finally, of course, uh, what we have said so far can be repeated for tensor modes. So we write down the Boltzmann equations for uh, the evolution of CMB anisotropies, including uh, in this case the uh, tensor perturbations, and we can derive uh, analogous expressions for the evolution of uh, tensor modes uh, uh, in the CMB field. Uh, we have a, a difference in this case because uh, tensor modes uh, quickly decay uh, away once they enter the horizon. So the contribution of tensor modes to, uh, to the CMB field is very localized at, at specific range of, um, of wave number or a specific range of, uh, of scales. Uh, but nevertheless, they are extremely important because they can provide additional and completely independent information about the uh, early stages of the universe and in particular about the physics of inflation as we have uh, uh, said, as we have seen uh, in the previous lectures. So what are the uh, statistical tools that we need to um, investigate all the physical properties of the CMB field that, that, that we have seen so far? Uh, again, uh, the, um, the CMB fluctuations, uh, because they come from the usual initial fluctuations that are Gaussian distributed, are Gaussian distributed as well. And so we don't care about the individual perturbations, but instead we care about the statistical properties, and in particular we care uh, about their variance or power spectrum. The power spectrum is usually given in terms of the um, harmonic uh, uh, expansion. So we take the temperature field as a function of the direction of observation, and we expand this field in, uh, in spherical harmonics, YLM, uh, with coefficients, with expansion coefficients that are given by this term here, ALM. Uh, the properties of these uh, expansion coefficients are, uh, are very simple. Because since CMB fluctuations are Gaussian, uh, we only need to care about the variance uh, of, this, um, of this expansion coefficient. So this average, uh, so-called ensemble average uh, over the uh, expansion coefficients. Because uh, we know that we are in the linear regime and therefore we can treat independently the different Fourier modes, this means that we can also treat independently the different uh, multiples uh, L and M, and so this average here only has sense when we consider uh, the same um, multiple L and the same multiple M. And finally, since the universe is uh, um, isotropic uh, on very large scales, so we, we have this property of, uh, of isotropy, this means that uh, this uh, average here, the variance, cannot depend on the multiple M. So it cannot have uh, um, anisotropic uh, uh, dependency. So this, um, uh, this variance uh, here can be written very simply in terms of the power spectrum CL, uh, where the multiple L is, uh, is the inverse of an angular scale on the sky, and we can very simply relate uh, the multiple L to the wave number K, simply remembering that uh, the, the multiple is, uh, um, is more or less equivalent to the product of the, of the wave number times the distance between us and the last scattering surface. Uh, the, um, if we go uh, back now for one second to the um, Fourier uh, space, uh, the um, correlation function of the, uh, of the anisotropy field of the CMB can be recasted in, uh, in this way here. Uh, 
um, that is very similar if you remember the expression of the matter power spectrum because here uh, we have the dependency on uh, PR which is the power spectrum of uh, primordial uh, perturbations times uh, this quantity theta square which is equivalent to the transfer function that we have seen in the case of the matter power spectrum. This is just saying to us that uh, if we want to know uh, the, the variance of the CMB field um, uh, at any given time, what we need to do is simply to take the initial power spectrum of uh, uh, primordial fluctuations and evolve this power spectrum depending on the physics uh, that is governing the evolution of the specific field that we are interested in, in this case, the physics uh, of the CMB. Uh, if we use this expression uh, for, the, um, uh, for the Fourier space to uh, define the um, power spectrum CL, so we take uh, the, um, the temperature field and expand it in spherical harmonics and compute uh, this average here in terms of the expansion coefficient, then it is very easy to show that uh, the power spectrum of the CMB in terms of the transfer function is simply given by this average over the different wave numbers uh, of the transfer function weighted by the uh, primordial power spectrum of, uh, of initial fluctuations. This is very important because it's telling us that if we observe the CMB field, we can have information on both the physics of the CMB itself but also on the physics of the very early universe, which is seeding uh, the initial perturbations that then lead to the uh, CMB field today. A similar expression, of course, can be uh, obtained also for the polarization field. Uh, what we need to do is simply to um, uh, use instead of the square uh, of the uh, transfer function for the uh, intensity field, the transfer function for the polarization field. So we can obtain a very similar expression where here delta is, is the equivalent of the initial power spectrum. It's just a different notation, but it's exactly the same thing. And this delta x and y are the transfer function for the fields uh, x and y, where x and y can be either the temperature or total intensity field, the E mode field or the B mode field. An important prediction of the standard cosmological model is that the power spectrum of uh, uh, TB and EB, so the cross correlation of the intensity field uh, with the B modes uh, and the cross correlations of the E modes with the B modes uh, are vanishing uh, in, uh, in the standard cosmological model because of parity um, uh, considerations. Basically, uh, B, uh, T and E have different parities, um, uh, have different properties under parity and in order to uh, preserve uh, uh, parity, according to the standard cosmological model, the only way is to let uh, these cross correlations uh, uh, to, be vanishing, uh, to be vanishing in the standard cosmological model. So if we were to observe uh, a non-vanishing cross correlation between these fields, this could be a very uh, important hint towards the fact that we might have encountered uh, some uh, uh, beyond standard model mechanisms that, I get, that can have seeded uh, this non-vanishing value of this power spectrum. So uh, what we need to do uh, to uh, find the current value of the uh, temperature uh, of the temperature field. Uh, from this expression here, it seems that if we want to uh, compute the variance at any given multiple, we need to evolve all the different orders uh, of the uh, Boltzmann hierarchy, of the infinite Boltzmann hierarchy uh, for CMB photons, because we need to know the transfer function as a function of the multiple L. However, uh, people have, uh, have proved uh, that we don't really need to know exactly all the different uh, orders of the Boltzmann hierarchy, uh, but we only need to know uh, a bunch of them. Uh, this is because after some algebra, you can rewrite uh, the Boltzmann equation in a, very, uh, in a very simple way, simply expressing the evolution of the CMB field uh, along the line of sight. So you integrate the Boltzmann equation 
uh, along uh, uh, the line of sight between the last scattering surface and us. Uh, if you follow uh, the algebra, it's not very difficult. You just have to move to Fourier space, rewrite, um, modify a little bit the Boltzmann equation so to have uh, um, a very simple differential equation uh, that, you can, that you can integrate over time. You end up with this very simple expression for the uh, temperature um, uh, CMB, uh, CMB field observed today. And the CMB field as a function of the multiple only depends on three different terms that are weighted by this uh, function here, which is the Bessel function. And the Bessel function comes from the um, harmonic expansion of the uh, exponential term in the, Fourier, um, in the Fourier space. So the dependency on the multiple comes from, uh, is carried by the Bessel function, which takes a different shape depending on the multiple. But the physics here is carried always by the same three terms uh, that appear in these curly brackets uh, in, uh, in this expression. Uh, these terms are the uh, Sachs-Wolf um, contribution, the first term, the Doppler contribution, the second term, and finally the integrated Sachs-Wolf contribution here. Uh, the G function that appear in the um, Sachs-Wolf and uh, Doppler term is the so-called visibility function and has to do with the probability of a photon to scatter of an electron. So it is very picked uh, at the time, as you can imagine, it's very picked at the time when this scattering can happen, so at the time of recombination and at the time of reionization, and it's vanishing uh, otherwise. So it only carries contribution at these two very distinct epoch uh, along the line of sight. The Sachs-Wolf term uh, is, um, depends on the uh, fluctuations of the CMB field directly uh, at the last scattering surface, corrected by some gravitational effects uh, carried by this uh, dependency on the metric perturbation. Uh, and the Sachs-Wolf is, uh, is the, the Sachs-Wolf term is basically telling us that uh, the photons that we observe emerging from the um, last scattering surface are either climbing off uh, potential wells, so um, over densities, and so in order to um, move out from over dense regions, the CMB photons has to lose energy um, because, uh, because of, this, uh, of this climbing. Uh, the other possibility is that they are traveling across uh, under dense region and therefore they are gaining energy because they are encountering these, uh, uh, these under dense regions. The second term is the Doppler uh, term and has to do um, with the fact that CMB photons are emerging from the uh, tightly coupled uh, regime with baryons uh, and this tightly coupled fluid is, mm, is moving uh, with uh, a given set of peculiar velocities. And so the CMB photons can come out from this tightly coupled regime uh, with, uh, um, with different peculiar velocity that are inducing uh, a Doppler shift in the CMB field. And finally, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect uh, is related to the uh, time variation of the uh, perturbance to the metric. And uh, this time variation arise only at very specific times uh, uh, during the evolution of the universe. Basically, uh, it, it, it arises when we have transition epoch, so from uh, radiation to matter and from matter to uh, dark energy. And when this happens, this term is non-zero and is inducing an additional um, uh, uh, shift uh, in redshift or blue shift uh, in, the, in the CMB field because the CMB photons are traveling across uh, time varying uh, uh, gravitational, uh, gravitational potentials. This is all the physics uh, that you need to integrate in order to compute the, um, uh, the power spectrum of the CMB field in uh, total intensity. And this picture here is uh, representing uh, the different contribution to the uh, temperature uh, CMB spectrum uh, from the Sachs-Wolf dotted line here, the first term uh, in, in the previous equation, the Doppler term, the dashed line, here and finally the uh, integrated Sachs-Wolf effect uh, 
uh, as this very tiny uh, dashed line, long dashed line uh, here that you see at the bottom. And when you um, sum up all these terms, uh, you end up uh, with the full uh, TT uh, power spectrum of the CMB. The situation is slightly different uh, or even slightly um, easier for uh, the polarization field because we have seen that the uh, only source of polarization is the quadrupolar terms. So the source function, the source function is the physical terms uh, that are included in this um, in these curly brackets uh, and that are weighted for the Bessel function. In the case of polarization, what enters here in these curly brackets are just the quadrupolar terms that are sourcing uh, the, uh, the polarization pattern. For tensor modes, we still have the quadrupolar terms because um, uh, the, um, because both of the uh, polarization pattern in terms of modes, but also because of the uh, quadrupolar nature of the uh, tensor perturbations to the metric, um, plus uh, additional contribution coming from the variation of the um, perturbations to the metric in case of uh, total intensity for uh, tensor modes. But the uh, the bottom line is that. Uh, the kind of steps that you have to follow are basically the same. Integrate along the line of sight and only retain uh, a few terms uh, that are responsible for the physics of the evolution of, uh, of CMB anisotropies. Uh, and you end up with uh, these um, shapes for the CMB power spectra. Uh, here on the left, we have the uh, power spectra, a uh, scalar power spectra, so the power spectra of the CMB that comes from scalar perturbations. And we have in blue the total intensity, in red the EE power spectrum, so the autocorrelation of the uh, polarization field uh, uh, for scalars, and we have seen that scalars only have E mode like polarization. And in green, uh, we have the absolute value of the cross correlation between temperature and polarization. Uh, an important thing that I like to uh, highlight here is that uh, if you observe the position of the peaks and of the thrugs of the uh, polarization power spectrum uh, with respect to the temperature power spectrum, you see that they are out of phase. And this is a prediction uh, for uh, uh, adiabatic initial conditions. So if we have adiabatic initial condition, we expect uh, the polarization field to be out of phase with respect to the temperature field. Uh, whereas if we have different initial conditions, for example, isocurvature initial condition, uh, there is a different relation between uh, uh, the position of the peaks in temperature and polarization. So identifying the pattern of the uh, polarization field with respect to the temperature field is an additional source of information about uh, the kind of initial conditions that we expect from the early universe. Uh, on the right, we have the power spectra for tensor modes, CMB power spectra for tensor modes, again in temperature blue, uh, E-mode polarization red, cross correlation between temperature and polarization in green. And in this case, we also have an example of the B mode pattern that we expect if there are uh, primordial gravitational waves. Uh, if you compare this uh, plot on the right uh, to uh, the plot on the left, uh, first of all, take a look at the um, uh, different scale on the y axis. We uh, here on the right, we arrive to a maximum of uh, 100, whereas on the left, uh, we are two order of magnitudes higher. So the uh, pattern in um, uh, the tensor pattern is uh, much more tiny uh, than what we expect from scalar perturbations. And the other thing is that um, at some point, at a, uh, from a given scale on, uh, basically once these perturbations have entered uh, the horizon, they quickly decay uh, as, um, as we expect the tensor modes do. Uh, we respect instead of the more rich pattern that we observe in the, uh, in the scalar case. Um, I'll just uh, go to the uh, third lecture. And in the meantime, uh, do we have questions? Yes, 
that is one uh, in from Luis Gavarra. How could we explain the phase shift from the physics point of view? Are they differently affected by the density parameters? Uh, the the shift is um, yes is due to the fact that uh, uh, when you evolve uh, the um, the the Boltzmann equations for uh, the uh, polarization we we know we have seen that the source term is the uh, quadruple uh, for polarization which carries uh, a different phase uh, with respect to the uh, to the monopole and in particular uh, it has um, it is out of phase with respect to the monopole so when we write down the solution for uh, uh, polarization in case uh, um, uh, yeah, when we write down the evolution equation for polarization with respect to uh, total intensity, we end up with this uh, phase uh, um, uh, pattern uh, in uh, auto, um, auto correlation for polarization with respect to the uh, temperature field. And this, uh, this difference is also, um, I mean, the out of phase comes from uh, from the fact that we are uh, sourcing polarization from uh, the quadruple, but the exact amount of the shift, whether it is completely uh, out of phase or if we have uh, uh, additional shifts, uh, is instead a prediction of uh, inflationary models. Okay, thank you, thank you. Luis Gavarra says thank you. Thank you, Martina. And I also say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> say thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Martina. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, so let's restart from uh, from here, from the shape of the CMB power spectra, and let's have a, a more in-depth look uh, to these to these shapes. Uh, let's focus for uh, for the moment on the uh, left of this slide, uh, so on scalar perturbations. We can identify three different regions in this uh, um, in this plot. Uh, one region that um, is related to large scales, so small value of the L multiple. Remember that L is the inverse of an angular scale. So if we go towards uh, small multiples, we are going towards larger angular scales. So um, large scales uh, uh, projected on the sky. Uh, and instead, if we move towards uh, a higher value of the L multiple, we are looking at smaller and smaller angular separation. So let's focus on the first part, so large, very large scales or very low multiples. In this combination. So these are uh, very large scales that were still uh, uh, super horizon at the time of recombination when the CMB pattern was imprinted and um, uh, free streamed from the last scattering surface to us. So this part of the spectrum is carrying information uh, about the um, initial power spectrum. It didn't have really time to be um, modified yet by uh, microphysics. But in addition to this, um, this is also the region where the um, integrated Sachs Wolf, uh, due to the uh, late time variation of the gravitational potential, is mostly prominent. So we have a double effect here. We have uh, primordial scales that were not affected by microphysics at the time of recombination, plus some late time effects that are due to the time variation of gravitational potential. And both these effects contribute to this flat shape of the uh, total intensity uh, field uh, in, uh, in, in, in the CMB. Uh, from uh, L more or less around 100 on, we instead observe this very peculiar uh, wiggling shape of the CMB spectra. And these wiggles are um, the imprint of the acoustic wave propagation in the photon baryon fluid uh, at the time of recombination. In particular, the first peak correspond to uh, a scale that had time at recombination to enter the horizon and fully compress uh, 
before uh, being frozen after decoupling. Uh, the, um, the first drug here uh, corresponds instead to uh, the scale at that time to compress and re-expand and so on and so forth until the uh, very, light oscillation, very uh, um, uh, late oscillations here that correspond to scales that were smaller and smaller and so had enough time to oscillate uh, uh, many more times before uh, getting frozen uh, in, this, um, in this picture. Um, at even higher values of the multiple, let's say from uh, uh, 1000 on, we observed this sharp decrease in the amplitude of the, uh, of the oscillations, uh, which is the imprint, the imprint of the diffusion damping or silk damping that we have discussed uh, this morning. This is due to the fact that uh, when we approach the scales, uh, we are approaching also uh, times where the tight coupling approximation was not valid anymore. Uh, and therefore, all the scales that were smaller than the diffusion length uh, were dumped uh, um, due to the uh, diffusion of CMB photons in between two different scattering. Uh, we have already discussed about the uh, out of phase uh, uh, position of the polarization uh, spectra. Uh, what I'd like to, um, to mention here is that if we focus on the behavior of the um, polarization power spectrum, EE power spectrum at very large scales, uh, we observe uh, two different bumps uh, um, here that corresponds more or less to the uh, emission of the acoustic oscillations uh, in the baryon photon fluid. But we also observe this very little bump uh, here at very low multiples or very large scales. This is the imprint of the reionization physics, so the generation of polarization at late times due to reionization. Uh, because if uh, there was no reionization in the universe, since polarization is only sourced uh, by uh, quadruple, it can only be sourced at the time of recombination. And therefore, uh, we will not expect uh, any amplitude here at very large scales uh, because there is no uh, early universe physics that can explain the generation of scalar uh, perturbations at these very, um, very large scales. Uh, this bump here appears because of the ionization, and this is one of the key targets uh, of uh, uh, the next generation of satellite, CMB satellite probes, to um, precisely constrain this region uh, of the CMB power spectra because we want to constrain uh, the uh, parameters that govern the physics of reionization in order to have a full picture uh, of the standard cosmological model. Uh, the same bumps uh, can be observed uh, here in the, um, on the right uh, plot uh, in uh, EE and uh, NBB. Uh, we have the uh, reionization bump here, which is uh, generated by the same physics that is producing the reionization bump uh, in, in the scalar case, plus this additional bump here at L more or less 100 that corresponds to the recombination bump. So this is the um, uh, peak that we expect in the tensor power spectra due to the fact that we are sourcing polarization uh, in tensor polarization at the time of recombination. Measuring this bump here, especially uh, in, um, in the case of B modes, because we don't have B modes in the scalar field, so measuring the B mode bump at recombination or even more ambitiously at reionization would be a clear indication that we have uh, primordial gravitational waves. And the amplitude of these bumps is proportional to the tensor to scalar ratio. But we have said that the CMB uh, field is also um, lensed uh, because when it leaves the last scattering surface, it comes across the evolving structures and is modified by the gravitational interaction with these uh, uh, gravitational potentials. Uh, what are the effects of uh, gravitational lensing on the CMB uh, power spectra? Uh, the, the lensing uh, is mostly uh, affecting uh, this region uh, of the CMB uh, power spectra, the, the so-called small-scale region or high L uh, 
region of the CMB power spectra, because we have seen that the average deflection is very, very tiny, it's 2.5 uh, uh, arc minutes, and therefore is mostly rele relegated to this region of the CMB power spectrum. The qualitative effect of uh, lensing on the CMB field is to uh, smooth out uh, the uh, sharpness of the acoustic peaks uh, in the CMB field. Let's have a look at this plot uh, on the right, where we have uh, uh, the shape of the uh, temperature power spectrum uh, with a zoom uh, on the very small scales or very high multiples, and in uh, blue, we have the power spectrum that we would expect in the case of no lensing. So if we were to evolve the CMB field uh, as if it was not interacting at all with the uh, gravitational uh, potentials at late times. Whereas in red, we have the lensed CMB power spectrum. So the power spectrum that we expect if we take into account the effect of gravitational lensing. And you see that uh, by comparing red and blue, uh, we see that the red curve uh, has much uh, smoother uh, and uh, uh, much smaller acoustic peaks uh, and throws with respect to the uh, to the blue curve. Uh, the cool thing here is that these data points are real data points from uh, observations from the uh, Planck satellite, which we'll see is uh, is one of the um, CMB observatories that that was launched. Uh, uh, in the past, um, in the past decade, so these are true um, observational points, and you can see that they like to sit more on the red curve than on the blue curve. So even if this is a very tiny, teeny tiny effect, nevertheless, uh, we have reached uh, the sensitivity to be uh, able to disentangle a fully lensed spectrum with respect to a fully unlensed spectrum. So we predict. Uh, uh, this uh, gravitational effect on the CMB field, and we observe this gravitational effect on the CMB field, which is very cool. Uh, the last thing that uh, we need to know uh, from a um, theoretical standpoint uh, is that, of course, uh, um, when we expand uh, a field, not just the CMB field, but whatever field in, uh, harmonic, um, in the harmonic space, in order to uh, recover the full expression of the field, of course, we need to take into account the infinite uh, set of functions on which we are expanding the field, uh, the field on. But of course, from the observational point of view, uh, we have uh, technological and um, uh, observational limitations that do not allow to measure all the infinite expansion coefficient of the harmonic expansion. So we only have access to a bunch of these, um, uh, of these harmonic coefficients uh, from which we try to um, estimate the true uh, power spectrum as if it was uh, uh, expanded in the infinite set of harmonic, uh, uh, of harmonic functions. Of course, this uh, um, disagreement between uh, what we predict and what we instead can observe because of observational limitation introduces uh, um, a source of error uh, that is called the uh, cosmic variance and is reported uh, in this function, in this, uh, in this expression here in this slide. Uh, the cosmic variance is a function of the multiple and in particular it scales uh, as the inverse of the square root uh, of the multiple, which is telling us that it is much more important uh, at very low multiples or very large scales uh, than uh, at small scales. And the reason is very easy to understand is because for any given multiple, we have uh, 2L plus 1 uh, ALM uh, coefficient. So if L is very small, we have a very limited number of uh, expansion coefficients that we can average over in order to recover the CMB spectrum at that, at that given value of L. But instead, if we move towards very high value of L, then the number of uh, expansion coefficients that we can average over for that given multiple is much more higher, and therefore our estimate of the true power spectrum will be uh, much closer to the true power spectrum than in the case of, uh, um, of large scales or small multiples. Um, do we have questions so far? Sorry, I have to switch to...
Uh, no, I don't to not full screen new. in order to try your question. I don't see any new one on the chat. So I don't know if someone wants to have questions, please uh, what, what, raise your hands if you would like to uh, ask something to Martina. I don't see any raised hands here. It's okay. So, okay. Well, yes, no, no more. No new ones, though. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's move to the observational part of, this, uh, of these lectures. How we can uh, observe uh, both the CMB field and the uh, matter field? Let's start from uh, the CMB field. Uh, we can have different avenues to uh, observe the CMB. We can observe it. Uh, uh, the, the preferred choice is observe the CMB uh, field from space, so launching satellites. And we have had in the past uh, three uh, different satellites that have provided uh, um, more and more refined picture of the CMB anisotropies. We had COBE uh, back in the days in the 90s, then WMAP, and you can see already the uh, comparison between uh, the um, sensitivity or the angular resolution of COBE, uh, the leftmost uh, uh, box uh, here in this slide, uh, compared to WMAP. And finally, we had Planck uh, in the past decade, uh, which uh, carried uh, uh, another huge improvement with respect to WMAP. Uh, the main reason for going to space is that from space, uh, we are less affected by uh, the um, contamination that we can have from Earth, in particular atmospheric contaminations coming from the interaction of the atmosphere uh, with, uh, with CMB photons. Atmosphere acts uh, as a filter for CMB photons, so there are only very uh, tiny um, observational windows that we can use from the ground. Uh, whereas if we are uh, on, in space, we don't care about the atmosphere, of course, and therefore we can have a, a much cleaner picture of the CMB sky. And we can also observe at different frequencies and being able to uh, disentangle the different signals that we collect from the space. Because the other um, part of the story is that uh, what I've said so far, uh, to some extent, assume that we only observe the CMB signal uh, from, um, from the universe. But this is, of course, not the case because we have so many sources of uh, high energetic radiation, uh, both uh, locally from our own galaxies, but also uh, extra galactic that comes from different astrophysical processes that, processes that place in the universe. And uh, the only way that we have to disentangle uh, the uh, cosmological CMB signal from these other different sources of radiation is to observe uh, the sky at different frequencies. And so, uh, to some extent, solve uh, this system uh, of um, uh, unknown uh, components uh, uh, by using observations at different frequencies. And going uh, into space is, um, is the best way to obtain uh, uh, both a clean signal and also a multi-frequency signal. Uh, we can also observe from ground. As I said, we have to be a little more careful because we cannot observe at many different frequencies. There are only a few uh, frequency windows that uh, are clean enough from atmospheric contaminations that we can use. Uh, but nevertheless, ground uh, um, has its own advantages because we can build uh, much larger facilities uh, on ground. Uh, on space, we, um, we have uh, uh, limited, spa limited space, <laughs> sorry, um, limited space because we uh, have to launch uh, this, um, uh, this payload uh, into rockets and there is no much space into, into the rockets in order to fold uh, very large telescopes, for example. But on the ground, uh, on Earth, uh, we, can, uh, we can build very large facilities. And the largest, the telescope, the smallest, uh, is the angular separation that we can observe. So the, uh, the, the highest uh, is the multiple that we can access from ground. The other advantage is that from ground, uh, we can observe for a long time. Uh, we, don't have, we do not have to worry about uh, the uh, fuel or uh, cooling of the system uh, and so on, uh, because we have our facility uh, on Earth, so we can, uh, we can access it uh, and, um, and continue operation for many, many more years. 
This means that we can integrate our signal uh, for a much longer uh, time and therefore we can have much deeper uh, maps uh, of the CMB sky. Uh, there are in fact a number of different CMB experiments that have been built uh, uh, on, um, on, uh, on Earth uh, uh, from, um, from ground-based facilities and that observe uh, the CMB sky at different uh, angular scales. Uh, the other option is to uh, put your experiment on a balloon and go uh, beyond the stratosphere. This will um, avoid the limitations of the atmospheric contaminations because we are going uh, slightly above uh, the, the atmosphere. Um, at the same time, this is not uh, so um, expensive as launching uh, a satellite, uh, but it has its own limitation because, of course, uh, uh, we, are, um, uh, we have less time for integration. The, the balloon cannot go around forever, of course, but it has to follow a specific, uh, uh, a specific path uh, and he has to be recovered uh, at some point when the fuel uh, uh, is, not, uh, is not available anymore and it lands uh, um, uh, down on Earth. So it's a, it has its own advantages, but at the same time, uh, some, some disadvantages. Uh, balloons are very important historically because uh, I don't know if you have ever heard about Boomerang, which, which was uh, one of the first experiments, if not the first at all, uh, observe the, um, the flatness, uh, to, to carry observational proofs of the uh, flatness of the universe. Uh, but let's go back to the current times, and this is the situation uh, today. Uh, this plot on the left summarizes the current observational points coming from different CMB experiments, both satellite, ground-based, and also balloon-borne, uh, that we have put uh, on the CMB spectra uh, so far. Uh, and you can see uh, that the picture is, is extraordinary because we are able to observationally cover a very large range of angular scales uh, for the CMB fields, uh, spanning from a multiple of uh, L equal to uh, up to uh, 4,000 and more. Uh, in terms of angular separation of this, um, on the sky, this means that we can observe uh, uh, the CMB fields from, ang from angles that go um, uh, from um, 90 or 180 degrees down to um, sub-degree and percent degree uh, separation on the sky. Uh, the importance of having different experiments uh, of different sensitivity uh, that are reported here on the uh, left side of this slide uh, this left plot shows the different sensitivities of different experiments. Basically, the lower is the curve, the lower is the noise uh, of these experiments. Uh, the importance of having these different experiments is exactly because different uh, realization of these experiments can observe a different portion of the sky, different scales uh, with different uh, noise properties. And so uh, only the combination of this experiment is able to uh, provide this uh, very um, comprehensive picture of the CMB field, both in temperature and in uh, uh, polarization. Uh, now let's move to uh, the um, observational probes of the, um, of the matter field. Uh, this is just a um, um, reminder of what is the, um, uh, the object that we want to observe in this case is the matter power spectrum. Uh, the situation is uh, a little bit more complicated for, uh, <clears throat> for the matter field because we cannot, uh, unfortunately, have access to the uh, full uh, density field. Uh, so cold, dark matter, baryons, neutrinos, and all the other components that cluster. Uh, what we can observe uh, is a tracer of the total uh, matter field. So we can observe a given class, um, usually of luminous objects, uh, we can compute the power spectrum uh, of this class of object and a posteriori we can say that we believe uh, this luminous um, class of objects to be a tracer of the total matter field that we have in the universe. So uh, we write uh, this following expression here that says, okay, I can observe the power spectrum of the class X, uh, but what I really want to measure is the total power spectrum. When I measure X, I'm measuring a biased tracer 
of the total matter power spectrum, which means that I can relate the total matter power spectrum to the power spectrum uh, that I observed via this proportionality function here, which is called uh, uh, the bias. And the bias uh, can be, in general, a function of the scale and of the redshift, uh, because this is telling us that the relation between the tracer and the total matter field can evolve uh, in time, but can also be different if we are looking at different scales. Uh, this is particularly true uh, if we uh, look at smaller and smaller scales, so higher and higher wave numbers, because uh, smaller scales have had much more time to um, evolve and to grow, and therefore they have enough time to uh, leave the perturbation regime, the linear regime, and enter the so-called non-linear regime uh, of the evolution uh, of, uh, of cosmic structure. The, the non-linear regime is realized uh, when we cannot say anymore that the uh, density field delta uh, is much smaller than the background value. Uh, when this is not true anymore, we enter the nonlinear regime, and unfortunately, we cannot use anymore all the uh, mathematical machinery uh, that we have discussed uh, this morning. Uh, for the nonlinear regime, we need uh, additional tools. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, mathematical tools that are um, that have been uh, refined uh, these days. Uh, that involves, uh, for example, the use of uh, effective field theory for uh, the description of the mildly nonlinear or nonlinear evolution of uh, uh, of cosmic structures. Uh, but the other avenue is to use uh, uh, n-body simulations, so to simulate uh, on uh, supercomputing facilities. Uh, the evolution of the cosmic structures uh, in, a, um, uh, in a simulated box. The idea is to uh, create this box uh, of, uh, of particles uh, with some set of initial condition, then apply the, uh, the Boltzmann equations for the evolution and observe how these different particles have evolved at different scales and different times. Um, at this time, uh, we still have uh, um, an incomplete picture of the evolution in the nonlinear regime, and this represents uh, uh, a limitation to our, uh, not really to our observations, but when it comes to compare uh, the observations at very small scales uh, that are truly nonlinear uh, with the comparison against theory. Basically, what we do not have really under control is the prediction of the theory. Uh, in the deeply nonlinear regime. Uh, you can say, okay, let's forget about nonlinearities. So let's just use the power spectrum up to the linear scale that we know very well how it evolves, and so we can compare it against observations. This is true, but this limits a lot uh, the, uh, the amount of information that we can extract from the matter power spectrum, because uh, what happens in the nonlinear regime is uh, as important as what happens in the linear regime. So neglecting all the data points that we cannot uh, theoretically uh, understand, it's a huge limitation to our uh, understanding of the universe. And therefore there is, uh, as you can imagine, a huge effort towards trying to um, improve our knowledge of the nonlinear physics uh, for the matter power spectrum. Um, the other information that we can collect from uh, the um, from the matter power spectrum, apart from uh, its full shape, is the behavior of the uh, matter power spectrum in the wiggling regime, where we have the baryon acoustic oscillation. Remember, these are the oscillations uh, that are induced by the um, uh, coupled photon baryon fluid uh, when the baryons enter the horizon, but are still too large to collapse uh, uh, according to the gene's uh, instability. Uh, the position of the uh, acoustic oscillations in the matter power spectrum, so the position in terms of the uh, wave number, or in real space, the position in terms of the separation uh, between two, uh, two points on the sky, uh, is a, um, an important standard ruler. Remember, during the first uh, lecture, we have discussed about the uh, angular diameter distance, which is the uh, observational distance that we can use uh, 
uh, to constrain the background geometry uh, of the universe when we have to deal with the standard rulers. The scale of the uh, BAO, the scale of the baryon acoustic oscillations, basically the position uh, of these peaks uh, is a standard ruler because we know the physics that is producing these oscillations and therefore we can compute uh, from thermodynamical um, uh, conditions, we can compute the physical uh, scale uh, of the uh, of the barrier acoustic oscillation, which is basically the sound horizon uh, for uh, for these acoustic waves. Uh, what we observe, however, is not the physical scale, but it is this scale projected on the sky, uh, and uh, and we have seen that. Uh, when we have a scale of known length that is projected on the sky, uh, we can use the distance between us and this projected scale to infer the evolution of the universe. And in fact, uh, measuring the position of the uh, baryon acoustic oscillations in the power spectrum is currently one of the best probes of the geometry of the universe that we can use uh, to constrain, uh, um, for example, the uh, matter content in the universe at late times or the uh, combination of the matter content with the, the dark energy content. Uh, additional probes uh, uh, of the large scale structures come um, instead of uh, observing directly uh, the shape of the matter power spectrum um, from the uh, integration of the matter power spectrum along the line of sight. Uh, for example, we can use uh, the, um, uh, the distribution of, uh, uh, of clusters uh, in the universe, and in particular, the distribution of clusters as a function of their mass and of their redshift. Uh, and this distribution function can be written in terms of a, an integrated expression of the matter power spectrum. So instead of measuring the matter power spectrum itself, we are indirectly probing uh, uh, some quantities that depends on the matter power spectrum. Uh, clusters can be observed uh, at different wavelengths um, in X-ray optical, but also in the millimetric, uh, um, uh, millimetric window. Uh, and uh, by reconstructing uh, the, the histogram, basically, of these clusters as a function of their redshift and their mass, uh, we can have information about the matter power spectrum uh, uh, that is needed uh, to, uh, to predict uh, their distribution uh, today. Uh, the information that we can collect in terms of uh, uh, cosmological uh, parameters of uh, cosmological properties are usually in terms of a combination of these two parameters here. We know already omega m is the density parameter for the matter component. And sigma 8 is another way of expressing the amplitude of uh, scalar fluctuations, but at late times. Uh, this represents basically the um, amplitude of fluctuations uh, inside uh, a, um, a sphere of a given length, which is 8 megaparsec, and more or less corresponds to the size of a cluster. It's, uh, it's just another way uh, for so-called late time probes uh, to constrain uh, the amplitude of, um, of density perturbations. Uh, another possibility is to um, reconstruct uh, the so-called uh, lensing potential uh, that, that is um, possible to um, that it's possible to do from observations of the CMB. We have seen that the CMB field is distorted by the gravitational potential, both in temperature and in polarization. And uh, observing these distortions uh, and uh, taking advantage of the non Gaussian features that these distortions imprint on the CMB field, uh, we can invert the problem and recover the uh, gravitational potential that has induced uh, this kind of distortions. And this potential is reported in, uh, in, this, in this plot here, together with the uh, observational data points that come from, uh, from different experiments. The lensing potential is, uh, is itself an integrated uh, um, expression of the matter power spectrum. So uh, if we probe the lensing power spectrum, we are also indirectly probing the matter power spectrum. The uh, key point here is that uh, 
uh, the, um, since the gravitational potentials are induced by the total matter um, in the universe, uh, if we measure the gravitational potentials, we are indirectly measuring the total matter uh, distribution in the universe, not just the luminous distributions as we uh, have seen a few slides ago, but the total matter distribution, including uh, cold dark matter. And this is uh, the reason why today there is a lot of attention in trying to uh, improve these error bars on the data points that we uh, see on top of this, um, uh, of this solid line here. Um, another possibility to trace the total matter distribution is still related to uh, lensing effect, but in this case we are using uh, uh, not the CMB uh, as a backlight, but we are using the uh, light emitted by uh, galaxies and clusters as a backlight. So we would like to observe how the images of galaxies and clusters are distorted by the uh, intervening matter between uh, these galaxies and us. Uh, this is uh, the so-called cosmic shear uh, and is telling us how much the uh, distribution of total matter, foreground matter between uh, uh, the, uh, the background image uh, and, uh, and the observer, uh, is, modify, is modifying uh, the intrinsic shape uh, of galaxies. Uh, together with lensing, this is also a probe of the total matter that we observe um, in the universe uh, and therefore is extremely important to, uh, to trace uh, the distribution of matter in the universe, especially at late times. Um, and finally, just to quickly mention additional probes uh, of the uh, distribution of matter, we can use light from very distant objects, uh, for example, quasars, uh, that is absorbed by uh, hydrogen um, clouds uh, in the intergalactic medium. This will generate the so-called uh, Lyman Alpha Forest um, uh, if we observe the, uh, the spectrum uh, uh, of the light emitted by these, uh, these sources as a function of, uh, of their frequency, we will see a series of uh, absorption lines uh, in, this, uh, in this spectra. Uh, and we can use these uh, absorption lines to reconstruct uh, the amount of uh, uh, hydrogen atoms or the uh, distribution of hydrogen atoms uh, that we have uh, in between quasars uh, and, uh, and observers. And again, try to link uh, the distribution of um, hydrogen atoms to uh, the total distribution of matter. The same thing uh, can be done uh, by observing, uh, instead of the uh, absorption lines, directly the emission lines uh, that are emitted by the atoms uh, that in, of the hydrogen at atoms uh, that undergo uh, the spin flip transition. Uh, this is the uh, famous 21 centimeter uh, observations uh, that can be used again as a, a probe of the uh, intervening uh, matter in between uh, distant sources uh, and us, and again use it as a tracer uh, of the total matter distribution in the universe. Um, so we have uh, uh, 10 minutes, more or less, in, the, uh, in these last minutes, uh, I'd like to quickly walk you through what kind of information we can collect from uh, all these wonderful observations. Um, the bottom line is that when we combine all these observations from uh, CMB observatories from different uh, probes uh, of the matter distribution in the universe, uh, Lambda CDM is the winner. So we have a model uh, that is the uh, standard model of cosmology, also called Lambda CDM, that can be described uh, by means of uh, six parameters. And out of these six parameters, two of these uh, describe the physics uh, of primordial fluctuations, the amplitude and spectral index of, uh, of the primordial power spectrum. Uh, two of them represent uh, density uh, parameters, the density of cold dark matter and density of baryons. Uh, another parameter can be used to constrain either the expansion rate or uh, uh, the angular size of the, uh, of the sound horizon. The two can be used uh, interchangeably. And the last uh, sixth parameter is uh, 
uh, a parameter that we use to model the physics of reionization, the uh, so-called reionization optical depth uh, or uh, tau. And the combination of all the probes that I've described so far are able to constrain these six parameters uh, to sub percent level, so an extremely high sensitivity to, la to the lambda CDM parameters, except for the optical depth, uh, which is one of the goal uh, of the next generation of CMB uh, experiments from space. And uh, we've tried to explore many different deviations from this lambda CDM scenario uh, by uh, allowing for freedom in different sectors, for example, curvature, neutrino sector, as you will see uh, from tomorrow on, um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis physics, uh, or uh, additional deviations from the uh, simplest inflationary paradigm. Uh, but when we try to uh, constrain these additional parameters that we can include on top of the six lambda CDM parameters, uh, we do not observe uh, deviations from uh, the expected values of this parameter in lambda CDM. And this is summarized by this grid of two-dimensional contours here that corresponds to the uh, constraints that we can put on different uh, uh, additional cosmological parameters with respect to the lambda CDM parameters using different combinations of CMB and uh, large-scale structures data. Uh, the vertical and uh, horizontal dotted lines uh, in this grid uh, of plots uh, correspond to the uh, expected values in lambda CDM. And none of these contours uh, is lying uh, very far from, uh, um, from the expected values in lambda CDM. Instead, they are exactly sitting on top of the prediction for lambda CDM. Uh, going a little bit more in details, uh, we do not see any significant deviations from the physics uh, of single field slow, slow roll. Uh, the shape of the primordial power spectrum is in agreement with the expectations from, uh, uh, from standard uh, inflation and also with the prediction of adiabatic initial conditions. We still do not have uh, uh, a measurement of the tensor to scalar ratio, but we are uh, excluding more and more a higher value of the tensor to scalar ratio, which means that we can exclude different models of inflation that predict a higher value of the tensor to scalar ratio. The goal here would be to arrive at least to uh, exclude or to measure R equal to uh, 0.01, uh, which um, is more or less a threshold for distinguishing between two main classes of inflationary models, the so-called large field and small field inflationary models. So uh, the, uh, the zero order goal for the next generation surveys is to arrive at least uh, to this threshold with uh, high sensitivity. We are not so far from this threshold if you uh, consider that the current upper bound on the tensor to scalar ratio is R lower than 0.04 and 95% confidence level. Uh, we see no deviations also uh, in, um, in terms of modification to the Einstein gravity. This plot on the left represents the current constraints that we have on uh, some phenomenological parameters by means of which we can modify uh, the Einstein equations. And we see the vertical lines here correspond to the expected values in, uh, in general relativity. And we see no deviations from, uh, uh, from general relativity at all. Uh, we also do not see any deviation from the description of that dark energy in terms of a cosmological constant as highlighted by uh, this plot on the right, where we are showing uh, uh, contours uh, uh, of the equation of state of dark energy, W, uh, uh, against uh, the density of, um, of matter. Uh, and you see that these contours sit on top of uh, W uh, equal to minus one, which is the prediction for uh, a cosmological constant. Uh, we uh, also, we haven't discussed a little bit about um, BBN, but uh, let me just uh, say that um, the predictions on the abundance of light elements that we can obtain from CMB observations are in perfect agreement with uh, the astrophysical observations of the uh, light element uh, abundances. In particular, the plot uh, on the right is showing uh, 
um, the abundance of uh, um, uh, primordial deuterium uh, against uh, the abundance of baryonic matter. Uh, the um, vertical band uh, is the measurement from Planck, so from CMB experiments. The horizontal line is the astrophysical uh, constraints on the uh, abundance of deuterium. Uh, and the pink line, the pink band, uh, is the theoretical prediction for uh, uh, the abundance of, uh, of deuterium. And you can see that the three bands uh, overlap perfectly with each other, showing uh, uh, a high level of agreement between uh, prediction and observations and between different observations of uh, complementary quantities, which is a great success. And finally, we can use uh, cosmological observation to constrain um, additional properties of dark matter, for example, uh, annihilation cross-section or uh, scattering cross-section. And in both cases, um, we obtain constraints that are uh, competitive and complementary uh, with constraints that we can obtain from uh, laboratory searches. I will not go uh, into the details of these, uh, of these slides, so you can ask me questions if you want later. But the bottom line here is that uh, cosmology uh, can, can help laboratory searches to, and, and, and the opposite is also true. So we can combine cosmology with laboratory searches to improve our knowledge about properties of, uh, of dark matter and trying to understand the nature uh, of uh, dark matter. So is this the end of this story? Uh, not really, because even if uh, at 2021 we have a, a very nice picture uh, of the standard cosmological model and we have a very highly sensitive measurements of the lambda CDM parameters and minimal deviations from this, um, uh, from this picture, uh, we are still left with some fundamental questions uh, that we would like to answer by means of observations. And these questions are mostly the nature of uh, uh, dark matter. Uh, it is a very good phenomenological description of, uh, uh, of the universe, but uh, we, we would really like to know what dark matter is. The same is true for dark energy. We need dark energy to explain the, phenomenolo the phenomenology of our universe, but we don't have a clue about the uh, fundamental properties uh, of this dominant component today. Uh, and we would like to observe primordial gravitational waves uh, to um, have additional proofs of the validity uh, of the inflationary paradigm or being able to discard a lot of uh, inflationary models uh, that are still valid uh, today. And finally, uh, a less uh, fundamental question, but still something that can help uh, unveiling some of these fundamental questions. Uh, in this uh, very uh, good picture of the standard cosmological model and extremely high level of agreement within different probes, we have some hints that something is not working uh, uh, very well uh, because we observe some important tensions between uh, different sets uh, of data set. Uh, and one of these, uh, uh, these tensions is the uh, famous or infamous uh, H-naught tension, basically the disagreement between cosmological estimates of the uh, Hubble constant and astrophysical uh, observations uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the Hubble constant. Uh, the level of disagreement today is at the level of uh, uh, four sigma, more or less, uh, with, the, uh, with the current picture. Cosmology, uh, different cosmological data set, prefers a lower value of H naught with respect to uh, astrophysical or so-called direct measurements uh, of the Hubble constant, as it is uh, summarized by this plot here uh, on the left, where the contours come from cosmological data sets and the vertical bands are instead the astrophysical measurements of H0. And you see that these two sets of, uh, uh, of constraints do not overlap at all with each other, showing that there is uh, uh, some tension between these two. Um, one possibility, of course, is that there are some hidden systematics that can explain this discrepancy if they are accounted for, but probably is much more interesting to um, try to pursue the, uh, the possibility that uh, this discrepancy is due to our incomplete knowledge of the universe. Remember that H0 uh, is an extrapolation of cosmology, 
Uh, and so if we are not describing the evolution of our universe well enough, our extrapolation will be, of course, incorrect. And acting on this uh, modeling of the universe by introducing beyond standard model physics, for example, can help uh, explain this tension and try to uh, put in agreement these two, uh, these two data sets. Uh, the ultimate uh, CMB and large-scale structure surveys are expected to come in the next decades. Uh, here it is a summary uh, of the main observatories that we expect uh, uh, from, uh, from the next year up to uh, 2030 and, uh, and beyond. Um, and from these surveys, we expect uh, um, an improvement, a dramatic improvement in the constraints of lambda CDM parameters, but also beyond lambda CDM parameters. And we hope that they will carry the required sensitivity to either solve uh, some of these long-standing tensions in cosmology, including the H0 tension, or um, uh, excluding uh, some of the explanations that are still valid uh, today. And finally, uh, just a um, prospect for uh, beyond 2030. Uh, recently, ESA uh, published the report uh, of the uh, proposed missions uh, for, the, uh, for the next to next decade. Uh, and these missions include uh, observations of the very early universe. Uh, so observations of uh, uh, gravitational weights in different wavelengths, but also uh, observations of uh, um, uh, CMB physics that can carry information about the early stages of our universe. So this is one of the main targets uh, of ESA, uh, the European Space Agency mission for the next to next decade. And I will leave you with this view uh, of the uh, far future or not so far future, depending on your prospects. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, even here or uh, on Gather Town. Or uh, if you would like to send me emails, I'll be happy to chat with you by email. Thank you for for your attention, and sorry for being with. Thank you very much, Martina. No, you are not late. Come on, it's two minutes. No problem. So I mean, we have a question from Jordan Seneca. Um, do current cosmological models? Are are current cosmological models able to accommodate both observed values for age? So if there is any cosmological um, model able to, mm -hmm. to explain this discrepancy so, between mm -hmm. low and high redshift measurement of H0, I guess, he's mentioned. Not in lambda CDM, nor in uh, simple extensions of uh, lambda CDM. With simple extensions, I mean adding uh, one parameter to the lambda cdm uh, model for example adding uh, uh, additional uh, degrees of freedom relativistic degrees of freedom or adding uh, um, dynamical dark energy component uh, all of these minimal extensions are not really uh, satisfying uh, in providing a solution to this h naught tension uh, there are more complicated models that can help uh, alleviate this tension. Uh, for example, if you introduce um, beyond standard model interactions between different cosmological components, uh, for example, uh, between neutrinos or between neutrinos and uh, uh, cold dark matter, or uh, coupling between dark energy and dark matter. Uh, I mean, all these non-minimal extensions to lambda CDM uh, in some cases can help uh, alleviate the tension, especially if you are going to modify uh, the early universe physics, so the physics uh, um, before recombination. Let me just uh, give you one more uh, detail about the way in which cos cosmology can constrain uh, H0. Uh, the main idea is that uh, you are using, again, a standard Euler, uh, the standard ruler is the um, uh, sound horizon uh, recombination, the position of the acoustic peaks uh, in the CMB, basically. Uh, you can measure this position very well because, uh, and you, um, so you have a, um, a measurement of the angular scale uh, onto which the sound horizon is projected on the sky. Uh, 
you know uh, what is uh, you know how to write the distance between the last scattering surface and us uh, in terms of cosmological parameters including h naught uh, and you are also able to write down the prediction for the sound horizon in terms of cosmological parameters and again it also depends on h naught so um, by comparing uh, this uh, uh, this observational measurement of the angular size and the theoretical prediction of the angular size in terms of cosmological parameters, you can have an estimate of H0. Of course, uh, uh, your angular size remains constant because that is the one quantity that you are measuring. So you can play with uh, both uh, the prediction of the uh, sound horizon and the prediction of the angular diameter distance uh, to modify this ratio in order to keep the ratio uh, modify these two quantities sorry in order to keep the ratio uh, constant and you can modify either the sound horizon or the angular diameter distance and it has been proved that uh, if you modify the angular diameter distance uh, including uh, models beyond lambda cdm that act uh, on uh, late time physics uh, basically uh, you cannot have uh, um, satisfying solutions to the H0 tension. Instead, if you act on uh, pre-recombination physics, so if you are able to modify uh, the, uh, the sound horizon uh, at recombination, then you can have uh, uh, a slightly higher possibility to solve this tension. So models that are able to modify early universe physics are uh, more able to uh, solve the H0 tension than models that instead are modifying the late time uh, universe physics. Nevertheless, there are still not 100% sati satisfying answers to this question, uh, even if many different models have been proposed uh, beyond Lambda CDM. So it's, uh, it's still a long standing um, issue and uh, and one of the uh, topic in current cosmology that is attracting a uh, lot of efforts from uh, from different uh, research areas, both in cosmology, but also in astrophysics. Thank and you, Martina. Theoretical models Great. starting yeah. for... Um, what the two of set values? So, yeah. uh, the, um, there is a slightly preference mm, I would say a slightly preference for the cosmological value, just because for the cosmological value, we have many different combinations of data set that are independent from each other, that are pointing towards the very same value. So in this plot uh, here, uh, these different contours, uh, the orange one, uh, the black one, green uh, and blue, have been obtained by combining different and independent cosmological data set. For example, the uh, black contours come from uh, um, observation of uh, uh, weak lensing, so the shear uh, observations that we have discussed before in combination with uh, BAO. Uh, the, um, the, green, uh, the orange contours come from uh, uh, BAO in combination with uh, uh, astrophysical measurements of uh, uh, light element abundances and the green contours come instead from CMB measurements. And you can see that all of them are pointing towards uh, uh, the same value of, uh, of H0 and all of them disagree with respect to the uh, local measurement of H0. So um, cosmology is strongly uh, pointing towards its own value uh, by using different and independent uh, uh, data sets uh, and this uh, led us to consider um, quite robust uh, this, um, uh, this indirect uh, estimate of H0 from cosmology with respect to the astrophysical one, but um, there is no definitive answer to, to this tension at all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, we too. <laughs> so very good. More questions for Martina? Please raise your hands. I don't see. So, um, raise hand or 
type it in the uh, on the chat please so they are thanking you of course thanks Martin, to you for for, uh, for attending thank you very much thank you so um Okay, so thank you, Martina, very much. Now, I guess that if there are questions, can keep on going on Gather Town, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Martina, again. Thank you, thank you for these wonderful lectures. Uh, Thanks all to you super for, well. for your attention. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.